learners and welcome back to this educational series. My name is Miss Pilgrim and today is all about the language of reports. But before we get into today's lessons, I want to remind you to visit the Ministry of Education's School Learning Management System where you can find tips and tricks to prepare you for SEE. Visit learn.moe.gov.tt. Let's get into today's lesson. Today, we are going to be reviewing the structure of the report. We will also explore what comprises formal, factual language. And also, we will explore sentence structures in reports. Let's get into lesson one, which focuses on using factual language. As you would remember, Report writing is meant to inform, to explain, to clarify, not entertain. And therefore, if you want an A plus report for SEA, you need to remember this. Remember the previous lesson on report writing? Let me tell you a secret. Come a little closer. Don't tell anybody. You can write an A plus report in just five paragraphs, just five paragraphs. In paragraph one, you are going to summarize the four W's. What happened, involving whom, where, and when. Then you're going to write two or three paragraphs giving details of what happened in chronological order. Of course, you must use factual information you must have some kind of formal tone. It must be formal because, of course, you want to inform. And we must use appropriate transitional words and phrases. And then, in your final paragraph, you're just going to give a brief discussion about what happened at the end. Just five paragraphs you need for an A-plus report. You have to remember, of course, to pay attention to the language because a report is meant to inform and therefore your language must be factual and of course it must be formal. I want to take you on a flashback to a previous lesson that I did on distinguishing stories from reports. Do you remember the incident at the bus stop? I want to remind you of the characters who were involved in this incident. Remember Calvin, who didn't like to go to school? And his long-suffering mother, who was trying to get him to, sc to school? Well, let's get into the report of what happened at the bus stop when Calvin did not want to go to school. Read with me, please. On Monday, the 23rd of March, 2020, at approximately 7.45 a.m., an incident occurred at the bus stop at Farley Street, Port of Spain. The persons involved were Calvin Hobbs and his mother, Darlene Hobbs. At 7.30 a.m., Mrs. Hobbs was accompanying Calvin to the bus stop. During that time, Calvin repeatedly expressed his lack of desire to go to school that day. While making these statements, Calvin held a blanket and threw household items into the street. After approximately five minutes, Mrs. Hobbs asked Calvin to stand still or he would be sorry. Calvin ceased all movement and remained standing with his mother at the bus stop until the school bus arrived at 7.45 a.m. When Calvin saw the bus pulling up to the bus stop, he ran in the opposite direction. Mrs. Hobbs followed Calvin, caught him, and ensured that he entered the bus and took a seat. As the bus was pulling away from the curb, Calvin could be heard repeatedly asking his mother to take him home. However, Mrs. Hobbs did not respond to his requests. Calvin remained seated in the bus until it arrived at Riverdale Primary School at 8.30 a.m. He proceeded to his classes without any further incident that day. 
It has an introduction, has a body, and has a conclusion. But important for this lesson is that even though many dramatic things are happening in this report, the language is very, very factual because the purpose of this report is to inform maybe the principal or some other person of what happened. We did not want any drama to occur, just the facts. So remember, students, that a report, reports contain factual language. What does that mean? It means that you need to avoid opinions. It also means that you need to avoid figures of speech. And it also means that you need to avoid emotive language. And we're going to explore a little bit of these in this lesson. Let's go deeper into factual language, using factual language. And we need to understand what is a fact? What really is a fact? Well, a fact is something that you can verify through a reliable source. Sounds very scientific. What's the meaning of verify? To verify means to check. And reliable means trustworthy. So a fact is something that you can check using a trustworthy source. But what is an opinion? An opinion is something that you cannot verify through a reliable source even though you think it might be true. Let's look at some examples to help you to understand the difference between a fact and an opinion. I want to show you something. Get ready. This is Jack's foot. How would you describe Jack's foot? You might say that Jack has an enormous foot. However, some people might say, that he has a small foot. Other people might say, well, he has a medium-sized foot. Which one would be correct? Which one would be a fact? Would any be a fact? Let's see. Let's examine Jack's foot closely. Now, let's examine Henry's foot. Let's look at Henry's foot, and let's look at Jack's foot. Can we still say that Jack's foot is big, or small, or medium-sized? What's the fact? Is there a fact? How can we tell if we were to describe, if we want to buy a pair of shoes for Jack? How can we say what size Jack's foot is to buy this pair of shoes? Hmm. That's the thing about words like big and small and medium-sized. Words, these words are opinion words because different people have different ideas of what they mean. One person might look at Jack's foot and say, Jack has big feet. But then another person might look at Jack's foot and say, Jack has small feet. So if you measure his foot with a ruler, you might find that Jack's foot is 15 inches long. Now, if we take this ruler and we take Jack to Paris and we measure his foot, would that measurement change? And if we had some kind of machine that could take us back to Trinidad and we went to, Mar to Maruga and we measured his foot with the same ruler, would that measurement change? Hmm. If we decide to go to ancient Egypt and measure his foot, would it still be 15 inches? Yes, it would be. Jack's foot is 15 inches long. That is a fact. It is a fact because you can verify it using a reliable source. In this case, a ruler, because we trust that this ruler is giving us the correct information. Let's look at another one. Today is a cold day. Or Today's temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. Which one is the fact? Today is a cold day. Of course, that is an opinion, because feeling cold differs from person to person. Right now, it's cold in this room, but for some people, it may be warm. 
My cousins in the States, sometimes, and sometimes of the year, they're wearing shorts and t-shirts when I need two pairs of jeans and a sweater. So the, uh, the, the opinion of what cold might be differs from person to person. However, today's temperature is 25 degrees Celsius is a fact. Why is it a fact? Because you can verify it, the temperature using a thermometer which is a reliable source. Let's try another one. The classroom was crowded with students. Fact or opinion? How about there were 45 students in the classroom? Fact or opinion? Of course, the first one is an opinion. The idea of what is crowded and what is not crowded differs from person to person. But there are 45 students in the classroom is a fact. We can check the class register, which is a reliable source. Welcome back, students. Just to summarize, your a report must contain factual language, and we have to avoid opinions. Another thing we have to avoid, figures of speech. So let's get into figures of speech. You've been writing for a very long time, students, and you know that figures of speech, like similes and metaphors, are tools that writers use to make their writing more exciting. So, the students scampered like crazy ants out of the school's playground when they saw the sneak. That's a very exciting sentence. What's the figure of speech in this sentence? Look at it carefully. The students scampered like crazy ants out of the school's playground when they saw the sneak. What figure of speech is that? Like crazy ants. If you guess simile, you are brilliant. It's a comparison between the students and crazy ants, how they're moving. So you can picture all these students scrambling around the playground because of this sneak. That's perfectly good for a story but not for a report, because a report is meant to inform. So remember, in your reports, you need to avoid opinions, you need to avoid figures of speech. What's the last one? We need to avoid emotive language. Emotive words are words that are packed with emotions or opinions. That's what emotive words are. And we don't want those in reports because we don't want any emotions in a report. We just want the facts. This is Hassan. He's my friend. What is Hassan doing right now? You might say, Hassan walked into the room. What else might you say about how Hassan is walking? You might say, Hassan strolled into the room. You might also say that Hassan crept into the room. Very interesting. And all of these words indicate movement, don't they? All indicate movement. But did you notice that these two are packed with opinion? If you're strolling into the room, what does that say? Maybe that you don't have a care in the world, you don't have anything to do, you don't have any time constraints, so you're just walking at your own leisure and pleasure. If you creep into a room, why might you creep into a room? Maybe you want to sneak something that you're not supposed to get, maybe. Maybe you're not supposed to be in the room, right? So that's an opinion, that's emotions. And so we would want the, those two, the last two in a story, 
but not in a report. We want the more objective term, the more factual term, Hassan walked into the room. We don't want any motive language in our reports at all. So, let's try another one. During our visit to the zoo, we observed snakes slyly hissing and plotting to take over the world. Isn't that a dramatic sentence? Hmm. What emotive, well, the whole thing is emotional, actually. Actually, the whole thing, the snakes are personified. They're given this personality. I mean, in real life, the snakes aren't plotting anything. They're just living their lives and doing what snakes do. But this writer is choosing to give the snakes the human quality of plotting the world. And there is an emotive word there. Two emotive words, actually. Slyly and plotting. Once you see the word sly, then you know that's not factual. Because what sly is depends on what your opinion of sly means. And plotting is full of opinion. Who's to say that the snakes are plotting or not plotting? So these are emotive words that we do not want in our reports. Not appropriate at all. Great for a story because we want to entertain and think about these crazy, evil, plotting snakes. But for a report, if you're writing a report about your visit to the zoo, your teacher doesn't want to know about these plotting snakes. They just want to know where you went, what stalls, etc. So stories are meant to entertain, as you know, and reports are meant to inform. So when you write a sentence like, the students scampered like crazy ants when they saw the snake, that's the story version of what happened. If you want to write the report version of what happened, it would be the students ran away when they saw the snake. Because we don't want to find out about being about crazy or anything like that. We just want to know the action. They ran away. That's the report version of the same thing. During our class, during our visit to the zoo, we observed snakes slyly hissing and plotting to take over the world. That's the story version. Here's the report version. During our visit to the zoo, we observed snakes in their cages. Factual information. We just want the facts, nothing else. No emotion at all, no opinion at all. That's the report version. So now that we've talked about what we don't want in our report, we don't want emotions, we don't want figurative language, we don't want emotive words, Let's look at a version, an extract from a report, and I'm saying an, a report because there's a lot of opinion and there's a lot of non-factual things happening in the report. Read it with me. On the 19th of May, 2019, a fire took place in the science laboratory of Achievers Primary School. The fire was started by two mischievous boys Tom Hansen and Jerry Mungle, both of Standard 5G. The fire started when Tom and Jerry decided to play with matches that Jerry had brought from home. The flame burned Tom's finger, so he hit it violently out of Jerry's hand, and it landed in a bin of paper. Suddenly, the bin burst into flames, and Tom and Jerry, fearing for their lives, sped away to get assistance. Soon, you could hear sirens screaming from a mile away. Students scampered like crazy ants all over the compound. Is this a good version of an A-plus report? What do you think, based on what we've been talking about all for this lesson? Let's look at it very carefully, and let's see if we can find the non-factual elements. Can you find opinions? Can you find emotive words? Can you find figure of figures of speech? Take five seconds and look at it carefully. OK. I've crossed out the non-factual elements for you. Let's look at the first one. The fire was started by two mischievous boys, Tom Hansen and Jerry Mungle. Why have I deleted that? Because it is an opinion. 
If you're writing a report, if your teacher wants to know what happened in the lab, he or she does not need to know whether the, the students are mischievous or not. They just need to know what happened and who was involved. So we don't want any opinions about their character and their traits. Let's look at the other thing I crossed out. He hit it, the flame burned Tom's finger, so he hit it violently out of Jerry's hand. Clearly an emotive word. It's packed with emotion, it's packed with opinion. We don't want that in a report. Let's look at this other one. Suddenly, the bin burst into flames. Again, emotive words. You don't want to put the word suddenly in a report because suddenly it says that something exciting is going to happen, something new is, is going to happen. We don't want to excite our readers for our report. We just want the facts. So we don't want suddenly in a report. And we don't want burst into flames either because that's just too much excitement, too much, too much emotion. We just want the fact that the, there was a fire. Soon, you could hear sirens screaming from miles away. Students scamper like crazy ants. Again, we don't want to hear about these screaming sirens. We don't want any figurative language. We just want to know that the fire truck came and we want to know when it came and what the students did. So it's very, very important when you're writing a report to ensure that opinions, emotive words, and figurative language are not there. So here's the revised factual version. On the 19th of May, 2019, a fire took place in the science laboratory at the Chivas Primary School. The fire was started by Tom Hansen and Jerry Munkle, both of Standard 5G. The fire occurred when Tom and Jerry decided to play with matches that Jerry had brought from home. The flame burned Tom's finger, so he hit it out of Jerry's hand, and it landed in a bin of paper. The bin caught on fire, and Tom and Jerry left the lab to get assistance. An ambulance was called and arrived at the school after 10 minutes. A much different version from the previous one because all the opinions and loaded words and figures of speech have been removed and you're on your way to getting your A plus report. So what have we learned in this lesson students? When writing reports, avoid the use of opinions, avoid the use of figures of speech and emotive words. Are you ready for my second lesson? I think you are, but let's take a short break. Welcome back students, we're back again looking at the language of reports and we're into lesson two which speaks about using formal language. You would remember that in lesson one we learned that when writing reports we need to avoid the use of opinions, figures of speech and emotive language. But the focus of today's lesson is using formal language. As you know, formal language uses standard English exclusively, and it avoids the use of slang, text language, and contractions. Let's get an example of some of these. Now, I am not a young woman. I'm not as young as you are, students. In my day, when somebody said something is good, they said it was iry. And in my day, when something was bad, it was good. So you see that real bad, and they meant that was really good. I did some research, and I found out that these are some terms that people are saying now. I don't know if, it's, if it is. Don't be shady. I think it means don't embarrass me. I think that's what it means. You all can probably explain and tell me at another time. Get your coin. Like, you know, earn that money. And why is this scene? I was told people still say, why is this scene? Which means, what's happening? How's it going? Those kinds of things. That's fine if you're talking to your friends. But when you're writing a report, we don't want any of these 
terms to enter because it's formal. It's for a formal occasion. And of course, we all have our cell phones and we all have our abbreviations. Maybe you can explain to your, to your parents what these abbreviations mean, LOL and BRB and IKR. And maybe you can explain, but we don't want these in our reports either because those are informal terms that we use when we're talking to our friends and not in our report. Also, we want to avoid contractions like Jerome wasn't watching where he was going. That contraction there is not suitable for report. We want the entire thing. Jerome was not watching where he was going. Patricia didn't arrive on time for her class. We don't want that contraction. Patricia, we want to write, Patricia did not arrive on time for her class. So we want to avoid contractions in our report. So we're going to look at an excerpt from a report, and we're going to see how we can adjust it to make it sound more formal, because formal writing is used in a report. And when we talk about formal writing, it means there is nothing casual about it, nothing entertaining about it at all. And of course, it must be exclusively in standard English. So read this report with me. On Wednesday, the 14th of September, 2019, an incident took place in the schoolyard of the Achievers Primary School. Three girls, Steffi Ali, Susan Chin, and Michelle Crawford from Standard 4 was playing basketball. Steffi take the ball and start to pass Susan. She tried to throw the ball in the net. Then she fell down and couldn't get back up. She started to scream because it looked like her leg break. The other girls run to help her. So we have a report here that has some elements that are informal. Look at it carefully. And let's see if we can identify what elements are informal and what elements of this excerpt need to be revised. Look at line one. Line one seems fine. On Wednesday, the 14th of September, 2019, an incident took place in the schoolyard of the Achievers Primary School. Sounds very formal. We're using standard English. There is no slang or anything like that. It all seems to be in good order. Let's continue. Three girls, Steffi Ali, Susan Chin, and Michelle Crawford from Standard 4, was playing basketball. Hmm, we have an issue there. That's not standard English. All right, so we need to fix that. Steffi, take the ball and start to pass Susan. Okay, we have another issue there. She tried to throw the ball in the net. We have another issue there. She fall down. That's an interesting expression. Can you fall up? Do we need to say down after we fall? Let's think about that. Couldn't get back up. Again, we have a contraction. Get back up. That's an interesting expression. Do we want that in the report, though? She start to scream. So we have an issue with, stand with um, lack of standard English there because it looked like, again, a non-standard English expression, her leg break. Another non-standard English expression. The other girls run to help her. So we have some issues. So let's go through and fix. So we're looking at the verbs. Three girls, Steffi Ali, Susan Chin, and Michelle Crawford from Stand 4 were playing basketball. So we have our standard English revision. Steffi took the ball and started to pass Susan. We have our standard English revision. She tried to throw the ball in the net. We revised the tense there as well. Instead of she fall down, she simply fell. She fell and she could not stand as opposed to get back up. She could not stand. 
She started, we changed the tense there, she started to scream because her leg was broken. Not that her leg break, which is another expression that is not standard English. The girls ran to help her rather than the girls run to help her. You've done very well, students. You revised this piece with me. So I think you're getting the idea of using formal language in your reports. So I want you to ensure that the language in a report is formal, that you use standard English exclusively in your report, nothing else but standard English. And of course, we avoid contraction, slang, and text language. We have one more lesson to do, students. Are you ready? Get ready. Stay tuned. Welcome back, students. We're back exploring the language of reports. This lesson focuses on varying sentence structures. We've talked about factual language. We've talked about formal language. But did you know that the sentence structure in a report affects whether or not the story is entertaining or informative? Let's take a quick flashback to our previous lesson. You would remember that you need to ensure that your language in your report is formal and that you must use standard English exclusively in your report, avoid contraction, slang, and text language. The focus of today's lesson, as I said before, is varying sentence structure in reports. So we're going to do a little bit of grammar here. Don't be scared. You've been studying sentences for most of your school life. So we're going to explore a bit three main types of sentence structures, and you know this. You know what a simple sentence is. This is an example. Christine was on time. It has a subject, and it has a predicate. It's an independent clause. It stands on its own. You know what a compound sentence is. Think a minute. See if you can remind yourself. Tell somebody next to you if you're, some, if you're next to someone what a compound sentence is. A compound sentence. Independent clause, Christine was on time, but Marilyn was late. Remember that a compound sentence is two independent clauses joined by a conjunction. Christine was on time, independent clause. Marilyn was late, independent clause. And then we have our conjunction, our coordinating conjunction, but joining them. And so we have our compound sentence. Let's get into the complex sentence. You know what a, compo a complex sentence is. Although Marilyn left home early, that's a dependent clause. That's the clause that can't stand on its own. If I just came up to you and said, although Marilyn left home early, you will maybe want to wait to find out what happened after. That's a dependent clause. It can't stand on its own. So although Marilyn left home early, she was still late. So we have our dependent clause, and then we have our independent clause. So when you learn about sentences in, in class, it's not just to write sentences. We want to use these sentences effectively in our stories and in our reports. Let's talk about how simple, compound, and complex sentences can operate in a report. I want you to read an excerpt from a report. The students arrived at the Asa Wright Nature Center. They disembarked the maxi taxi. They lined up. Their teachers gave them instructions. The students proceeded in a straight line to the entrance. I'm going to read it again. 
the students arrived at the Asa Wright Nature Center. They disembarked the maxi taxi. They lined up. Their teachers gave them instructions. The students proceeded in a straight line to the entrance. That sounds very robotic, doesn't it? Very jerky, it doesn't flow. Why? Why is this excerpt like this? Think about the sentences. Look at the types of sentences that are used in this excerpt. What type of sentence is used? You would notice that there are too many simple sentences. And also, you will notice that there needs to be some transitional words to improve the flow of the report and to improve the clarity of the report. If you just fill your report with simple sentences, your report will sound very jerky, very robotic. So we need to add some conjunctions, maybe, transitional words, to make it flow. Let's look at this version of that same excerpt. The students arrived at the Asa Wright Nature Center and they disembarked the maxi, maxi taxi. After they lined up, their teachers gave them instructions. Then they proceeded in a straight line to the entrance. Let's read it again. The students arrived at the Asa Wright Nature Center and they disembarked the maxi taxi. After they lined up, their teachers gave them instructions. Then they proceeded in a straight line to the entrance. Do you feel is that this is an improved version of the previous extract? Remember, in the previous extract, there were all these simple sentences. But now, in this extract, we have a variety of sentences. Look at the extract carefully. I'm giving you five seconds. Look at the extract carefully, and let's see if you can identify simple, compound, and complex. Take five seconds and examine this extract. Okay, my very brilliant students, I think you know. Let's see what's going on with this extract and how it has been improved. Did you find the compound sentence? The students arrived at the Asa Wright Nature Center and they disembarked, disembarked the maxi taxi. We have two independent clauses going on there. The students arrived at the Acer Wright Nature Center. That's one independent clause. They disembarked the maxi taxi, another independent clause. What have we done? We've joined them with the conjunction and, and we've made it a compound sentence. Let's look at the other sentence. After they lined up, their teachers gave them instructions. What kind of sentence is that? We found our compound sentence. What kind of sentence is this? After they lined up, their teachers gave them instructions. Can you find an independent clause, a dependent clause? What's going on there? You're right. It's a complex sentence. The dependent clause, after they lined up, and then we have the independent clause, their teachers gave them instructions. So we've taken the conjunction and we've made it, we've made it a complex sentence. Finally, we have our simple sentence. Then they proceed in a straight line to the entrance. Simple subject, they, they and the rest of the sentence proceeded in a straight line to the entrance. So we've taken an extract that was very robotic and jerky, and we've made it flow logically by varying our sentences. So be careful in your reports. In your reports, you want to avoid the overuse of simple sentences. It gives the report a very jerky feel. In a story, you want to use a simple sentence or two when you want to talk about something dramatic, like the snake slithered, the students screamed, Everyone was afraid. That builds tension. But we don't want to build tension in a report. We want just the facts. So we want to ensure if we vary our sentences and ensure that we have simple sentences if we need one or two, 
but we want some more compound and complex sentences so that your reader can flow logically in this report or in any report. Remember too that transitional words like after and then, they are very helpful as well. So what are the lessons we have learned today, students? You need to remember, in a report, include facts only. Maintain formal language. No slang, no non-standard English terms, no text language, no contractions. We want to omit all our emotions and all our opinions. We want to focus on logical structure and sequencing. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. I want to remind you to visit Ministry of Education School Management Learning System at learn.moe.gov.tt. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope that you look forward to another lesson.